Welcome everyone to today's presentation. I love how those of you who've been joining us on previous sessions today recognize that the music was not playing on that, um, on that video. Um, I love listening to that video. Every time I watch it, it almost brings tears to my eyes because it reminds me of how much our community and our kids are working together to find treatments for PWS. And that's why I'm so thrilled to have today's presentation, which is a return of results presentation. So to kick off today's session, I would like to present to you Anish Batnagar, CEO of Seleno Therapeutics. Thank you, Susan. Um, my name is Anish Batnagar. I'm the CEO of Seleno Therapeutics, um, also one of the physicians involved in uh, the DCCR development program at the company. Um, really thankful to FPWR for giving us the opportunity to speak here today. And also um, shout out to Susan for the amazing job she's doing keeping this train running. It's a challenging time with all of uh, what's going on. Um, the, the format for today, we were going to take about an hour of your time. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the rationale for DCCR and it's uh, the design of the Destiny PWS study. Um, Dr. Miller will talk about the results of the study. And then uh, we'll have Larry Bauer speak with us for a few minutes. Larry has spent uh, more than a decade at the FDA. Uh, in the rare disease program and his passion really is bringing patient and caregiver voices to drug development. Uh, his group in Washington has been very helpful to us in DCCR development uh, until now. So what I'd like to do is, um, this is my disclaimer slide, we are a public company. Um, what I'd like to do is just take a minute to talk about Seleno for a second. So Seleno is a company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're in a place called Redwood City. When we are in our offices, that's where we are. Uh, Selena was formed with the sole purpose of taking DCCR through phase three development and approval. And that really is our singular focus at this time. We are really thankful to uh, the PWS community for all the help and all the work that's gone into this program. And uh, as you will see, uh, a lot of good seems to have come out of it. So I want to start uh, the, the presentation with this slide, which is not directly related to DCCR and is not new. You may all have seen this in the past. This is from the PWS Natural History Study. It was done many years ago at several institutions in the US. Um, and what this shows you is insulin levels in patients with PWS. What you see on the left slide is that the fasting insulin levels are actually not very high in PWS. But postprandial insulin, which is insulin after you eat, is actually dramatically elevated to the extent that in these patients who may not even have high BMI, it's elevated to the extent of these patients who have morbid obesity. So this led to the thinking that there may indeed be the possibility that a drug that reduces secretion of insulin could actually have beneficial effects on PWS. And that's exactly what DCCR is doing. Uh, DCCR is disoxide choline controlled release. It's in a tablet form. Uh, it is based on a known parent molecule called DCCR, which is not approved for PWS. And I'll talk about that in a second. But DCCR is given once a day. It's a tablet. It provides a stable level of the drug in the circulation for an entire day. Disoxide, which is approved today for a single rare indication called hyperinsulinism, is not approved for PWS and for good reason. Uh, there are several reasons why it's difficult to use. It has a long bitter aftertaste. It's very hard to dose an oral suspension, uh, but it does have about 40 years of history to teach us more about disoxide. The most prominent reason why disoxide is nearly impossible to use in a situation like PWS would be the PK profile, or what happens to the drug when you give it to someone. The graph that you see on this slide is the comparative profile in a study that was conducted with DCCR and proglycin, which is the currently approved version of disoxide. The red line is proglycin. So when you give someone disoxide today, there's a very sudden rise in blood levels of the drug, which you can see in this red line. What this does is it can have a quick effect, but it also has a lot more side effects. In addition, disoxide is bound to proteins in the blood. So it's very quickly taken up from the circulation. So in order to achieve a high enough level of disoxide in the blood, you have to repeatedly dose it during the day at these high levels 
and put the person at significant risk for these side effects. DCCR was designed to get around these problems. And that's the blue line that you see here. With once a day dosing, you have a stable level of drug, which allows us to not only have a better safety profile, but also allow us to have efficacy with doses that are half to a third of what can be used with disoxide today. So these are the data that you'll see going forward. Um, the question is, how does DCCR work? Why does it work? So DCCR acts on a channel called the ATP-dependent potassium channel, also called the KTP channel. Um, this channel is, uh, is present in many parts of the body, in many tissues, and it appears that by opening the channel in all these tissues, DCCR can have beneficial effects in several aspects of PWS. So for example, in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is responsible for appetite, it can reduce the secretion of a certain peptide that increases appetite. In the vagus nerve, it can directly and indirectly increase satiety by stimulation of that nerve. In fat tissues, it can reduce the deposition of new fat and it can cause the burning of existing fat. And in the pancreas, it can decrease the secretion of insulin. So all of these effects taken together can have benefits on many different parts of PWS. So DCCR has been studied um, extensively. Um, there is significant published data with disoxide as a parent molecule, but DCCR before PWS was evaluated in five different phase one studies and two phase two studies. The idea of these studies was to really understand the safety profile of DCCR, how it should be dosed, how the dose should be titrated, and that informed us to take it into a pilot study in PWS, which as some of you may know, was conducted as a single center study at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, the results of that study are published and what they showed was significant reductions in hyperphagia, loss of body fat, increases in lean body mass, and reductions in aggressive behaviors. So um, this was a small study and the idea really was to confirm those findings in a larger study, which is why we designed the phase three program for PWS. Um, the program consists of two studies, the C601 study, also called the Destiny PWS study, and that's a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study, uh, DCCR versus placebo. And patients who complete 601 were able to roll into an extension study called 602. 602 was initially designed as a nine-month study, but based on feedback that we received from uh, physicians as well as caregivers, we have now extended that study to up to 36 months. So in this program, uh, we had an initial period where patients were screened. Uh, if they met the, the criteria for screening, they were enrolled. They were once again assessed for eligibility at the end of those two weeks. And then if they were eligible, randomized two to one DCCR to placebo. So 127 patients were randomized um, at 29 sites in the US and the UK. Uh, 85 DCCR, 42 placebo. 120 completed the study, and 115 of them rolled into the open label extension study. More than 100 patients remain on the extension study at this time. Uh, just to note that the treatment on the 601 study went on through the end of April. Uh, the pandemic, as we all know, set in around early March. We continued the study, and the data that we are presenting today is all data through the end of the 601 study at the end of April and the available data in 602 at the time. So a quick word about the, the design of the 601 study. Uh, the subjects enrolled were, or they all had genetically confirmed PWS. They had at least some level of moderate to severe hyperphagia, at least two, uh, four years of age, no upper limit of age. And uh, I believe our oldest patient was in the mid forties. Uh, the subjects needed to weigh between 20 and 134 kg, and they were put in weight bands uh, depending on the exact weight. The dosing was based on a milligram per kilogram level that was found to be effective in the earlier study. And as some of you may know, we titrated the dose in two-week increments up to a maximum of six weeks. There were no BMI or body fat entry criteria in the study, and there was no recommended reduction in energy intake or changes recommended in diet, et cetera. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, there were 29 sites who enrolled in the study. The largest enrollment came from the University of Florida with Dr. Miller as the PI, and I'll now pass it on to her to talk about the results from the study. Dr. Miller. Thank you so much. So as Dr. Bhatnagar said, I'm gonna talk about the results from the studies of 601 and, and some of 602. So this first slide just shows the characteristics of the people that were enrolled in 601 um, drug versus placebo. And it basically shows that there was no differences overall in any of their baseline demographics between those who were randomized to receive drug versus placebo in the 601 study. Can, I can't switch the slides, right? I think you have to switch the slides. All right. Um, so this was the primary endpoint, which was change in baseline in hyperphagia questionnaire score from baseline to visit seven or week 13 in 601. And what you can see here is that while there were declines um, on DCCR in the hyperphagia questionnaire score during that time, there were also some placebo responders and had the, who had some decline in their hyperphagia questionnaire score as well. It was more um, significant in those who were on DCCR, but overall the differences did not meet statistical significance between DCCR and placebo. So one of the reasons that we thought that might be was because, you know, we, it's well known that in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders that there's a really strong placebo effect in studies. Um, especially treatment studies, you know, people really want something to help their child. And so, you know, we knew from the previous Zafgen study, which was done many years ago, that in adults that placebo response lasted about two weeks. And so for this study, there was a two week placebo run in um, to try to ameliorate that placebo response. But what this slide shows is that that placebo response actually stuck around for a while and it starts to go down around week four. And as you can see by week 13, the placebo response is virtually extinguished with a, a significant difference in hyperphagia questionnaire score between those who received drug in green and those who received pl placebo um, with a more significant decline in those who received drug versus placebo. So this graph shows you that data in sort of a graphic form, um, which I like. Um, so what you see on the far left is the primary endpoint data that I just showed you, where you can see that there's no real statistical significant difference between those who are on drug and those who are on placebo at the end of 601. But Salino had identified some um, pre-exist or some, identif some pre-identified subgroups of hyperphagia questionnaire score, so 13 to 19, above 20. Um, and so to see if there was any difference in the degree of hyperphagia and response to DCCR. And what this graph shows you very beautifully is that indeed there was. So those with the higher baseline hyperphagia score had the most decline on DCCR. Um, versus placebo. And so you can see that those who had a hyperphagia questionnaire score over 20 at the beginning, which is really what you should have to be in nutritional phase three, you have really significant hyperphagia. And you, those people had a really significant response to DCCR that was statistically significant. The higher the hyperphagia score at baseline, the more response they had to DCCR. And you can see that in those who had the highest baseline hyperphagia score of greater than 22, they had an almost 10 point reduction in their hyperphagia questionnaire score, which is virtually unheard of. I've, I've done a lot of studies. We've never seen anything this um, profound. Next slide. This is a waterfall plot showing the same idea that um, the more significant change you had in your hyperphagia questionnaire score, so the more you improved, the more likely you were to have been on drug versus placebo. Next slide. And these are the individual questions from the hyperphagia questionnaire score. And what you can see here, there are nine questions. And what you can see is that eight of the nine DCCR exceeded placebo in terms of responsiveness of decline of score. The one that I think is the most important here and the one that struck me the most was question seven, which is how often did the person try to steal food? So, you know, we've done a lot of studies and, and I can tell you that in, in studies that are ongoing and studies that we've done before, you know, one of the things that, that we hear when people are answering this, this question is, well, yeah, they stole four times, two weeks, you know, the last time we answered this, but now they've only stolen once in the past two weeks, but, but boy, it was a doozy. You know, they cleaned out the cabinet, they ate 10,000 calories all at once, you know, we found all this empty stuff under their bed. 
And so, you know, it just didn't feel right to me. It didn't feel like a real decline in hyperphagia if they were still getting into food and eating that much calories. And, and one of the most profound things I think that I saw in this study was that while there was an improvement in the overall score, there was an improvement in sort of the quantitative, qualitative nature of the food stealing. So they would steal a piece of bread instead of a loaf of bread. Or my, my favorite story was the girl whose dad stocks vending machines for a living and had a box full of M&M bags in their garage. And she stole and ate one of those M&M bags, which her mom counted as one episode of food stealing during the past two weeks. And I did not because I would have taken one of those bags and eaten them. So I don't think that really counts as a Prada Willy behavior, but whatever. Um, but it was that kind of thing. It was that, so it was this, both this, the sort of quantitative number decline, but also this sort of qualitative, you know, decline in the degree of food seeking, seeking that we saw. Next slide. So the secondary endpoints that were used um, for this study were the clinical global impression of improvement at Visit 7. This was done by the um, principal investigators at each site. Um, and then we also looked at DEXA data, looking at body composition, um, lean muscle mass and fat mass. And then there was a caregiver global impression of change that was done at week seven as well, um, which was the individual's parent or caretaker um, assessing how things had gone during the study. And you can see that, oh, sorry, <laughs> he switched too fast on me. Um, but you can see that both the, the um, investigator, clinical global impression of improvement, and the DEXA data had statistically significant responses on DCCR versus placebo. Now you can switch. Um, this is the clinical global impression score. Um, and so this is the one again that was done by the investigators. So this was done by us as the PIs talking to the families, you know, interacting with the kids, kids watching, listening to what the families were saying. And what you can see here is that it was pretty clear to investigators who was on placebo because they rated nine, about 90% of those on placebo as having no change during the 13 weeks of the trial. Whereas those on DCCR had a more improvement um, during the course of the trial. And this, this was sort of a general question. This was a question about just the kid, the Prada Willie itself, um, and, and not anything really specific. So this was our impression as investigators of, of how the kids had changed or not changed during the study. And as I said, you can see that it was um, significantly improved on DCCR versus placebo. This is the caregiver one. And as you can see, and as I mentioned, it is not statistically significant. And you can see that there's a trend towards improvement on DCCR versus those on placebo. But overall, there was a lot of responders that said that they didn't see a change. I really, I've thought about this a lot, and I really think that there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that um, the drug was slowly titrated up during 601, and I think when you're dealing with a titration, you know, sometimes the, the um, effects are a little bit more subtle, a little bit more slow to sort of come on and be noticed. But the other thing I think is that I really believe that a lot of parents go into trials wanting their kid to be cured. You know, they want to get rid of the prader willi syndrome. And so, and this was, again, this was a very general question. How is your kid's prader willi compared to what it was when, when you started the study? And so, you know, one of, I, I could tell you a million stories about why I think this is, but you know, what I was thinking of today when I was talking to another physician was that, you know, this other doctor had seen one of my patients in clinic and his note was just raving about how awesome this patient was doing and how she was so great and she had lost weight and blah, blah, blah. And mom had no complaints. It was a complaining mom. She had no complaints. Um, and so I was, I was thrilled. And I said to the mom, when she brought the kid in a couple weeks later, I was like, oh, so she's doing really good. And she's like, she's okay. I don't really see anything. And I was like, are you serious? You know, Dr. So-and-so said all this stuff. And she was like, well, she's still got Prada Willie. And it really struck me like, oh my gosh, these parents really are thinking that perhaps this is going to like cure it and get rid of all the Prada Willie. And, and that's just, it's not possible, right? You know, their drugs are designed for a reason. And certainly this drug does get rid of a lot of the core features of Prada Willie, but it was just really interesting to me what they expected versus what we as investigators expected. And I will say that, um, and this is probably not the right place to say it, but I'm gonna say it anyway, um, is that as we went through 602, one of the things that parents would say to one another in the hallways or in my clinic is, it's not perfect, nothing's perfect. 
but on a day-to-day -day basis, our lives are significantly better than they were before this study. And that to me was tremendously meaningful. So while you don't see it in this data set, it was there and it just, it continued to be recognized over time. Next slide. This is the DEXA data showing the changes in body composition. And as you can see, um, there was a significant decline in fat mass in those um, on DCCR versus placebo with a significant increase in lean body mass on DCCR versus placebo. And those of you who have been to many of my lectures may know that I have always poo-pooed this um, because I <laughs> never believed that a change in body composition meant much, especially in the absence of something that worked on hyperphagia. Um, so this was a nice combo for me that it worked on both. But, um, but you know, what I really saw in this that was clinically, mean, clinically meaningful was that it allowed the kids to do more physical activity. So they were rollerblading, they were bike riding, they were going to the gym. And so it really did improve their quality of life, which Honestly, I wouldn't have thought of that changes in body composition would do that that much, but they really did. And it was, it was remarkable and is still remarkable to see what these kids are doing. I mean, you know, they're out there on the challenge site doing planks and push-ups and supermans and all kinds of yoga poses and running 5Ks. You know, it's pretty amazing. So I was wrong and change in body composition does matter. So that was, that was really neat to see. Next slide. This is, so I mentioned that the other caregiver um, questionnaire just uh, was about prader willi per se. This is um, the caregiver questionnaire about change in food related behavior. So they sort of pulled out overall prader willi, overall behavior, overall food behaviors. And what you can see here is there was a significant improvement in food related behaviors on DCCR versus placebo. Um, and so that was kind of interesting to see that they were able to pull out that, that positive effect on food stuff, you know, talking about food, sneaking food, that kind of stuff, um, but just not on the sort of overall Prada Willie Gestalt. Next slide. So the next slides that I'm going to talk to you about are some, are some lab data that goes along with this data. Um, and it's, it's really super cool lab data. And so I wanted to explain it to you so you understand um, why it's so cool. Um, so this is data from the natural history study that um, Dr. Botnikar mentioned at the beginning of his talk. And this was done at, at four sites throughout the US. And one of the things that we saw in this natural history study as we followed kids over many years was that as they get from nutritional phase 2A to 2B and 2B to 3, that their leptin and insulin levels rise quite significantly and they stay high as they continue through life. So once you're in phase three nutritionally, your insulin and your leptin are high and that's how they stay the rest of your life typically in the natural history of Prader Willi. Next slide. And this is what we saw with DCCR. So you can see that on DCCR, the leptin declined really statistically significantly um, versus those who were on placebo. And adiponectin, which is another um, adipose-related hormone, but it's actually cardioprotective. You want it to go up because it's cardioprotective and it usually goes up with weight loss. And what you can see here is that the adiponectin indeed did go up quite significantly in those on DCCR versus placebo. Next slide. This shows the changes in fasting insulin um, from baseline to the end of the um, seven weeks or week, or yeah, week 13, seven visits. Um, and what you can see is that the fasting insulin levels also went down quite significantly during the course of the study. Again, not the natural history of Prader Willi. This is this is contradictory to the natural history of Prader Willi. It's changing it, and and that to me was remarkable to see this data. Next slide. And these are the changes that home IR is just a measurement of insulin resistance that takes into account blood sugars and, and insulin levels. And, and basically what this shows is the same thing is just that the insulin resistance and insulin levels overall went down in those on DCCR versus placebo. So ghrelin, most of you have heard of, ghrelin is your, your hunger hormone. And you can see here that on DCCR, total ghrelin um, decreased versus placebo and acylated ghrelin, which is the active ghrelin, which makes you more hungry, really decreased versus placebo. Um, and unacylated ghrelin, which is actually the one you want, it's the cardioprotective ghrelin, went up slightly on DCCR versus placebo. So, so that was really amazing to see that all this lab data really correlated very strongly with the data that we were getting on you know, the questionnaires and on the DEXA scan and that kind of stuff. Next slide. 
Um, so then 602, as, as Dr. Bhatnagar mentioned, um, started after the 13 weeks of 601 was completed, people were offered the opportunity to roll into the open label. And so this data that I'm going to show you now was from those who completed 13 weeks of 602 as well as 60, having completed 601. So there are some people in this group um, who um, who uh, had completed six months of being on DCCR. So they've been on DCCR during 601 and then they continued on it during 602. And there are some that had completed three months of being on DCCR at this point. So they had been on placebo during, DC, during 601 and transitioned to a drug during 602. And so the numbers are a little bit smaller because as he mentioned, 601 did not complete enrollment and, and analysis until the end of April. So, so by the time this data was analyzed, there weren't quite as many patients who had completed 13 weeks of 602. Next slide. And what this shows is, is even more remarkable. It's that those on DCCR continued to improve with time. So over the next three months, you know, they had gotten significantly better on DCCR in terms of hyperphagia questionnaire score, but they continued to get better over the next three months of 602 with their scores going down by an average of like 48%. It was unbelievable. And those on placebo actually had a quite remarkable decrease in hyperphagia score as well. Um, despite having been on placebo in 601, when they got onto drug, they responded very, very well as well with a significant decline in their hyperphagia score. So this slide shows, you know, the, the um, change at, sorry, this slide shows the change in hyperphagia questionnaire score. And what it shows is that basically, the longer you're exposed to drug, the better your, the more significant your hyperphagia score decreases. So that you can see that by this, you know, by 13 weeks or, or I'm sorry, by three months or six months on DCCR, almost everybody is below the line, which means that they've had significant improvements in their hyperphagia questionnaire score on DCCR. Next slide. So one of the things that, that Selena was collecting that at the beginning I thought was a little bit fishing, but then I saw that, you know, these significant differences. So I asked that they analyze this um, as part of the data analysis. And there were these questionnaires about behaviors, you know, that are common in prader willi And I, it really came to my attention, um, the first kid that came in who had recognized in herself that she was probably on drug during 601 and she came skipping in one day and she's like, Dr. Miller, the medicine's working. And I was like, how do you know? And she said, I'm not thinking about food all the time. I'm not sneaking food. And her mom goes, and her freaking OCD is gone. And I was like, nope, drug doesn't work that way. And she says, well, you're the doctor, but I'm telling you her OCD had to do with clothes. It had nothing to do with food and it's gone. You tell me how that happened. And so I was, I was so I was watching and listening and asking and, and sure enough, it just was amazing. So the, you know, the repetitive questioning went down, the irritability and rigidity went down, the anxiety went down, some of the skin picking went down and the OCD went down. I mean, like these, you know, we had kids that were collecting every brochure in the hotel room, you know, in the hotel to bring with them. And then, you know, just one day we'd be like, where are your brochures? Oh, I forgot them. I left them at home. Sorry. You know, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it was incredible. And it was things that I personally probably wouldn't have paid that much attention to had the mom not brought it to my attention, but you heard it virtually across the board for everybody. And what I could really see is, and I promised a mom that I talked to on Tuesday that I would tell her story because it's a great story. Um, this girl um, was, um, was one of the kids that you all know, where is, you know, what time is it? Do you know what time it is? Dr. Miller, what time is it? You know, 10 o'clock is snack time. Dr. Miller's 10.01. It's 10 01, Dr. Miller's snack time, 10 o'clock. And she was visiting her grandparents this past weekend. And the grandfather said to the mom, Oh my gosh, it's an hour past her lunchtime. Should I, you know, go get her? And mom said, Yeah, you can go get her. You know, she's outside on the trampoline, but, it, you know, don't make her come in if she doesn't want to. And he's like, Well, her lunch is on the table and it's an hour late. So he goes out and he says, Do you want to eat your lunch? It's on the table. And she's like, Nah, I'm okay. I'm jumping on the trampoline. <laughs> The, the grandfather, the mom said the grandfather was just blown away. She said, he was like, oh my God, like this is a kid that lived by the clock and now it's an hour past her lunchtime and she was like, I'm occupied, I'm good. So, um, so I thought that was, that was really amazing. 
And I'm going to ask you to hold the slide right here for just a second, um, Dr. Bhatnagar, because I do, one of the things I didn't ask them if I could do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, is that, you know, I think that one, the most important thing to me to hear as a physician, and I'm sure for you as parents, is to hear the words of other parents. And so this is an excerpt from a letter that one of the families actually wrote to Selena um, in August of this year. And the mom gave me permission to share this, um, which is good because it's one of my favorite letters I've ever read in my life. And I won't read you the whole letter. I'm just gonna read you a little paragraph from the end of it that I thought was really, um, really telling of how this drug affected families. She wrote, last year at a graduation party for one of our daughters, my husband and I each had to miss half of the party so one of us could stay with our son. Well, another daughter graduated this year. We had a smaller gathering at home due to COVID, but the point is the whole family was there. Everyone was able to enjoy themselves without somebody having to constantly keep an eye on him or, gu or guard the food. As a family, we have begun to laugh again and enjoy time together. These are luxuries that I am sure that you and the majority of people you know don't realize are luxuries. For us, these are major accomplishments. These luxuries have been missing from our lives for a very long time. We're starting to see the sweet boy again that we hadn't seen since phase three of this syndrome started. We've missed him so much. We have hope again. We are starting to heal as a family. We can begin to see a future that is not paved with heartache. In closing, during this unprecedented time with the added stress of COVID, I fear to think of what state our family would be in right now had our son not been in this trial. We would like to express our sincerest gratitude to Selena for giving us our son back. And I just, I personally think that says it all. And now I'll go through the safety data. You may now change the slide. <laughs> um, and so this is the safety data, all drugs, as you know, and you all who are my patients hear me say this a thousand times, every drug has risks and benefits. And, and it's all about weighing the risks and benefits. And so this drug um, had a well-known safety profile as Dr. Botnikar indicated. And, and the most common side effects from the drug are known to be increased body hair growth or hypertrichosis. Um, edema, specifically um, lower leg edema, um, and hyperglycemia or high blood sugars. And you can see that indeed all of those side effects were more common in people who were treated with DCCR versus those who were on placebo. But what Dr. Bratnikar pointed out to me yesterday, which I actually found very interesting, is that on DCCR, 83% of people had a treatment-related adverse event or a treatment, um, what's the right word? Uh, an adverse event during treatment, whereas 74% of those on placebo had an adverse event as well. So I just thought it was really interesting. The adverse event profile was not that much different between drug and placebo, although these, these specific adverse events, which are well known to the drug, um, did occur more commonly in those on drug versus placebo. And the next slide just shows about serious adverse events and adverse events leading to study discontinuation. And I think we can go ahead and flip to the next slide um, because it's easier for me to say than looking at that chart. Um, and that is that the safety profile of the drug was really consistent with what is known about diazoxide and prior experience with this drug, DCCR. Most of the events um, that were adverse events were really mild in severity and there were no really high severity um, events noted in the study and there were no serious unexpected adverse reactions um, related to DCCR. So just um, I'm on behalf of Selena saying thank you to all the, the sites that participated. There were a lot of them and they're all listed here. And on behalf of me and Selena, I would like to say thank you to everybody who participated in the trial. You know, you guys, this took an amazing amount of time and effort on your part, and we all know it. There was a lot of travel. There was a lot of questionnaires. There's a lot of follow-up required. Um, and we ask a lot of you on a routine basis, even now, even after the 601 part is, is over. And I just want to say thank you, because I know how much it took out of your families to have to do this. But if you look at these kids and you look at these normal preteen teen kids, just being kids, it was well worth it, I think. Um, and I think every family who participated would agree. <laughs> Allie said, I love that. One of the moms wrote, it's the benefits are worth it a minute, million times over. Um, and the next slide is, um, 
it's deeply personal to me. Um, this is Camden Locklear, has, who, as many of you know, we lost in August of this year. Camden was not part of the DCCR trial, and I was asked to very clearly make that point that this is not being done because of DCCR. I'm doing it because I felt that the right time to honor Camden was actually at this family conference. You know, Camden was an amazing kid. He was six years old when he passed away. He had a smile. If you've ever met him, you know, he had a smile that lit up a room. He was like the mayor. Um, everybody knew him. Everybody loved him. When Twyla and I were, would be mad or upset about growth hormone crap, Callie would send us videos of Camden dancing and singing to Simon and Garfunkel's I am a rock, I am an island, and it would cheer us up every time. And, and so I just wanted to say, you know, in, in honor of Callie and David, his parents and his brothers, Jaleel and Peyton, that Camden will always be remembered and will always have a special place in our hearts. And the reason I wanted to do this at this family conference, and this was the only time I was speaking, so it happened to come on the end of DCCR, um, but again, not because he was in the trial, um, was because I really wanted to say thank you to all of you families. You guys stepped up and were just absolutely amazing. And I can't even say thank you enough. You, you all raised money to make it possible for them to have a funeral, a funeral for Camden. Without your help, that wouldn't have been possible. And I just, I, I sat and watched those numbers in amazement every day. And I, it just really warmed my heart. And it made me realize, you know, this is why I do what I do every day, because I love you guys. You guys are an amazing group of people. You're so giving and loving, and you embrace every single one of these families as part of your family. And so I wanted to do this to say thank you to you. That's all. <laughs> All right, so um, we're gonna head into some Q&A before we go on to our next speaker. Jen, thank you so much for sharing the data from this study. The results seem incredibly promising. And as a co-funder of the phase one study, FPWR is very excited to hear the positive results of this phase three study. Um, and to that end, uh, you know, it was our community who really chipped in to make that co-funding of that phase one study possible. So not only has our community helped in participating in the study, but they actually helped get it off the ground as well. So thank you again to everyone who has had such an active role in making this study happen. Um, with that, let's go to Q&A that questions are coming in. The first question we have is, at what nutritional phase would you begin to introduce DCCR? Is this something that you're recommending for those who are already in phase three, or could this be something as a, that could be used as a preventative? So I think, and I'll let Dr. Botnagar speak to this too, but personally, I think that right now it should be used for individuals who are in nutritional phase three. I think that the data remains to be found for those who are in earlier nutritional phases to see if indeed it would prevent the onset of phase three. And also, yeah, I mean, these are growing, developing kids we're talking about here. So we do want to, I think, need to do more studies in kids in those earlier nutritional phases to make sure it is safe and, and potentially efficacious in that, in that group of children. Dr. Botnagar? Agreed. Uh, this study was designed to be in, in subjects who had moderate to severe hyperphagia, pretty much nutrition, nutritional phase three. So at this time, that is indeed the case. But as Dr. Miller pointed out, there's some really interesting data on the biomarkers that could represent an interesting opportunity for us to study it in earlier stage disease. But uh, at this time, no. Um, so looking at the data, it seemed that patients experienced benefits um, the longer they were on the drug. From your study, can you estimate how long a person um, should expect it to take to see full benefits? I, I think every family's definition of full benefits is probably different, right? I mean, every family has their own unique issues. You know, this is not a box population that everybody's the same. So I, I can't answer that. I mean, I think that, that everyone is a different person. And so, um, you know, all I can say is that families, you know, through the course of all of this, you know, as we've continued on through 602, you know, they all just continue to say, I can't imagine how we would have handled COVID without this. Like, I know what my kids used to be like, and I know what they're like now, and I just can't imagine how we would have lived through this. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, it's really hard to say. And in follow-up to that question, how long did it take for the drug to begin to take effect? So as parents are hopefully getting on the drug when it gets, if it gets approved, we're hoping it gets approved, 
how long should they expect it to take before they can they start noticing improvements just to, for expectation setting i mean i would say i would say two to three months probably but really by six months so a person needs to expect to if they if they start a prescription that they need to stay on it long term and not give up on it well, you know, one of the reasons the drug was titrated, and I think this is more of a question for Dr. Bonegar, but I, one of the reasons it was titrated was um, to try to prevent, you know, side effects from the drug. And I think that that is going to be the way it is going to be, would be prescribed as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I think uh, we typically tend to prescribe the way we do the phase three study. And I think the rationale for doing the way we did it worked because the adverse event profile was actually very acceptable. So I think um, the data suggests, as, as you're saying, Dr. Miller, that you take two to three months to start to have an effect, and by six months, pretty much everyone should be seeing an effect. Uh, but I think we will want to maintain the titration in this way, at least for now, while we gather more safety information. Were there any uh, obesity requirements for participants to participate in the study? No. And will there be any obesity requirements for prescriptions? Also, no. no. Also, no. <laughs> That's a concern that I'm, see I'm seeing a lot in, our, in the Q&A is, you know, my son or daughter is not obese. Will that preclude us from access? No, no, no. All that data, all that really impressive DEXA data, I mean, these were my patient population. You all know, I mean, I mean, look at these kids. They're, they're not big kids, you know? So no, there was no obesity requirement and there will be no obesity requirement. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the DEXA scan. There was a question about body composition change. How dramatic was that? It was pretty dramatic. You know, I, I actually, I kept saying I was going to look at this and I actually haven't looked at it yet. I feel like it's more dramatic than growth hormone, quite honestly, just looking at it because it happened over 13 weeks. And I don't feel like we see that degree of improvement in body composition with growth hormone over 13 weeks. We see it with growth hormone over a year, but not over 13 weeks, you know? So um, now I couldn't say that with any certainty. That's just my gut feeling. Okay. Susan, is it okay if we have Larry speak for a few minutes and come back to Q&A? You know, it is. And I think that's a really great idea because a lot of the questions that we're now having come in are regards to the timeline and application to the FDA. So, um, Larry, if you're ready, let's let's get you on board. I can go ahead and start while Dr. Botnagar is setting up. Yeah. Um, so, so my name is Larry Bauer, and it's a pleasure to be with you all today. My talk is going to be a little bit different from the talks that we've just heard, but I hope that they all this information links together. Um, as Dr. Bottenauger said, I used to work at the FDA in the Rare Diseases Program, where we did a lot of work with patient advocacy groups. And one of our goals was to try to help patients be more engaged in the drug development process. Um, so I'm gonna, that's what I'm here to talk to you about today a little bit. I'd like to give you an overview of FDA drug review, just maybe clarify some of the things that Dr. Miller and Dr. Bottenauger said about the stages of drug development and then give you a little bit of background about patient engagement and how a patients, how, did, how has this evolved over time? And then more specifically for your community, how can you get involved and at what stages in drug development can you get involved? And then I think we'll have a few minutes left and at the end you can submit questions either to me, Dr. Miller or Dr. Botnagar and we'll be happy to answer. Next slide. So when a new drug is being developed, this drug has to be tested and it goes, you, you've heard Dr. Miller talking about phase one study, phase three study. So I'm just going to go kind of quickly through what these are. So when a drug is first developed, data for the first kind of data is preclinical. So this is before it goes into human beings. It's an exploratory phase and it's often done either in test tubes or we do animal studies to see how animals react to the drug. Once we have that initial safety data, we move into phase one. So at phase one, it, it's, it's a phase to determine the safety and the dose of the drug. So before they give it to patients, sometimes the drug is, is given to healthy volunteers. People volunteer to be in a study where they try to see how is this drug metabolized in the body. And then after you have that initial safety data, it goes to phase two. And in phase two, this is when it's actually tested in patients with the disease. We want to learn more information about how effective the drug is 
and we test the safety a little bit more in small numbers of patients with the disease to get some, some additional safety data. Safety data is actually collected at every phase of drug development. Once we have that initial effectiveness data, we go to phase three, where we confirm effectiveness by giving it to a larger number of people with the disease. We, we look carefully at the side effects when we give it to more people. Are there certain side effects that show up more often? And in general, like I said, it's given to just a larger number of patients. Once we have phase three data, all of this data from all the phases is put into a, a drug submission to the FDA where it can be reviewed. The FDA makes a decision and either yay or nay, they approve the drug. And then phase four is actually once a drug is approved, so it's called post-marketing. So after the drug is approved and available, we continue to monitor safety and side effects, sometimes giving it to more people, new side effects or, or you know, might emerge. Uh, next slide. So how does FDA review a drug? So when this package, all this data is submitted to the FDA, the FDA organizes teams of reviewers to review the chemistry of the new drug. How is it manufactured? They look at the, the non-clinical data, so that's the animal data. And then they review all of the clinical data. They also do their own statistics statistical analysis. So a company analyzes the data, but then the FDA does their own analysis on the data. And they try to make a de determination, like Dr. Miller mentioned, about the benefit-risk evaluation. So do the benefits of this new drug outweigh the risks? Some people ask, how long is an FDA review? So once this data package is submitted, there's two types of review. It can either be a standard review, which is 10 months long, or in some cases, it can be a priority review which is four months shorter. So it's a six month review and it's for drugs that would provide a significant improvement in treatment, diagnosis or prevention of a serious condition. And the FDA makes that determination what kind of review it will be within the first like two months of looking at the drug. So you might be asking yourself, why does it take so long? And the thing is that the FDA takes their job very seriously. This FDA review is the last step in the development of a drug before it becomes available on the open market, available for physicians to prescribe it. So they're kind of like the last gate that a drug has to go through, the last place that you can kind of evaluate this drug. Uh, next step. So once a new drug application submitted to the FDA and it's under review, the only place for patients to really contribute to the process at this point is if there's an advisory committee. Now I have to, a caveat is that every drug review does not have an advisory committee. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, so when FDA is reviewing the data submitted, they're going to consider the totality of evidence when deciding whether to approve a new drug. This means they're going to look at every piece of data that's, that's been submitted to them. Um, for a drug like DCCR, for instance, it, it impacts several different aspects of, of Prader-Willi syndrome. We just heard Dr. Miller talk about all these different measurements. Uh, you know, there's, you know, body measurements, there were lab values, uh, different rating scales. So the FDA is going to evaluate all of this, and then they're going to make a decision based on the totality of evidence. Um, and this data that's submitted, it includes both objective and subjective endpoints. So an objective endpoint is something that you can measure reliably. So reduction in body fat mass, that's something that you measure, you get a number, and it's an objective data. You can't, it, it, there's no fluctuation. It's just an objective data. Same thing with the lab value. It's, it's an objective something that you can measure. There are also subjective endpoints. These are things that maybe are a little bit more qualitative. They might take a little bit of more of judgment or have opinions, like for instance, the perception of hunger. That is a, a, a subjective endpoint. And the FDA will consider both objective and subjective endpoints in their evaluation. So the FDA looks at the possible benefits of this new drug when they look at the data and they compare them to the possible risks or side effects of the drug. It, when they're doing this evaluation of benefit and risk, they also look at how serious this, is the disease, what other treatments are available to people with this disease, and how effective are the current available treatments for people with the disease. And this all helps them to evaluate. So in a, in a, 
a group of patients where there's still a lot of unmet medical need, maybe the treatments that are out there just don't really do that much to help, that really goes into the FDA's decision about whether or not to approve the new drug. Uh, next slide. So now I'd like to talk, talk a little bit more about how patients have become engaged in the process of drug development. So historically, the patient voice was not included in drug development. Drugs were developed by scientists, by physicians, and patients were not included in the discussion. This took a major turn in the 1980s when we uh, were all living through the AIDS epidemic and AIDS activists demonstrated outside the FDA. Uh, you know, young people were in their 30s, 20s and 30s were dying at an alarming rate. There were no available treatments. And people, you know, these groups had sit-ins at the FDA and they had put up signs like time isn't the only thing the FDA is killing, you know, it's killing us as well. Well, this really got the FDA's uh, attention. And so the FDA invited people from these groups to have a seat at the table to give input into drug development. And since that time, stakeholder engagement and patient engagement has become a priority at the FDA. They really want patients' voices to be heard at the beginning of drug development and throughout the process. They feel that patients are the experts on their disease and they can help inform things like how to design the study, what are risks that the people with this disease will tolerate, and what are some of the symptoms that are most important to patients to be treated, and only patients and their caregivers really understand what's most important to them. Uh, next. So how can you get involved specifically? Well, the first thing is that the prater willi uh, community has a great thing that you have the Global prater willi Syndrome Registry. This is an awesome tool that will help scientists and doctors understand the course of the disease. It's, it's helping to map out the natural history of prater willi Syndrome. Um, if you do get involved in this registry, we hope that everyone completes the information accurately and keeps it up to date so that we have the most reliable data as possible. And if you haven't joined the registry yet, there's information about how to join at the Foundation for uh, prater willi Research website. Um, another thing you can do is participate in clinical studies. We, you know, we just reviewed a major clinical studies and these studies cannot happen without your participation. So please, if there's any way you can consider enrolling in a study, that would be very helpful. Um, it, you can help scientists, clinicians, and drug developers understand what is important to you. You know, by participating in studies in the registry, you continue to support the scientific development of new treatments for prater willi on the side, you can be educating your family, friends, and physicians about the disease. And maybe most importantly, it, which I know you're already doing, is but support each other and your patient advocacy groups that are out there representing you. Uh, next slide. So how has the Foundation for uh, prater willi Research supported patients and caregivers? You have a wonderful advocate in Dr. Teresa Strong, who's the director of research at, at FPWR. She's a member of a, a group called the FDA Patient Engagement Collaborative. This is an initiative by the FDA to engage with outside groups to help FDA understand how patients can be engaged in drug development and review. There's only about 16 people on this collaborative, so you're Prater Willie's so fortunate to have a representative like Dr. Strong. And then interacting with the FDA, a couple historical things. In July of 2015, there was a prater willi Clinical Trial Consortium workshop where they discussed opportunities and key challenges for current and future clinical trials. And you can see a summary of this on the FPWR website. And then in November of 2018, there was the PWS Clinical Trial Consortium that had a 90-minute meeting with the FDA called a Critical Path Innovation Meeting. This meeting was with staff from the FDA, and it was to help educate them about things like the unmet medical need in prater willi syndrome. How do we define hyperphagia? You know, there's different ways of talking about that. What are some of the tests and measures that are used in research studies? And all of this information can, is going to help uh, drug developers to come up with better ways to um, design studies for prater willi and the summary of this meeting, once again, can be found on the FPWR website. Other ways to interact with FDA, there's something called a patient-focused drug development meeting. 
These were started by the FDA to uh, gather information from patient and caregivers about the disease symptoms, daily impacts, the treatments they use, and hopes for the future. And these meetings are currently organized by patient advocacy groups. So, that, you know, your patient advocacy groups would have to take the lead on that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can participate in advisory committees if they have one. And you can become a patient representative, which you can apply to at the FDA, or there's something called an open public hearing where any patient, whether in the study or not, can share their experiences and preferences. Uh, next. So in summary, the FDA re really views patients and their caregivers as the experts. These are the people that we need to hear from. So please, if you can, work with the you know, FPWR on all of their initiatives. They're doing great work. Uh, remember, the patient input can help to select or develop measurement tools that will evaluate outcomes that are important to you. It can also help with understanding whether trial results represent something meaningful to patients. So does a new drug treat symptoms that are important to patients? And can we appropriately balance the benefits of a new drug against its risks? So thank you very much. And I think we still have a little time for questions. Yes, that is, that's great. Thank you so much, Mr. Bauer, for that information about how um, the process runs through the FDA for approvals. We have a number of questions that may, some of them may have been addressed by your presentation. Um, so we'll run through as many as we can in the next couple of minutes. Are you guys okay if we run over a couple minutes over the hour? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just do a couple. Um, how about body composition for adults? Um, adults that are finished growing in their 20s and 30s, would we expect to see an improvement in body compos composition for those individuals? Oh yeah, we saw a great um, improvement in body composition in those individuals with or without growth hormone on board. Because remember, this, this study wasn't age limited in, in terms of an upper age limit, so there were adults in the study. Great. And as far as the timeline, you mentioned six months with a fast track approval for the FDA to approve. When do you anticipate that review to begin? Tough question. Um, you know, we, uh, we have said publicly that we will be, uh, we expect to meet with the FDA in the latter part of this year, and we still expect that to be the case. The timeline really depends on what happens at that meeting. Um, as Larry's pointed out, there's different paths this uh, review can take. So we have to get agreement from them and then we'll see, we'll certainly keep the community updated on that. Mm -hmm. This was an international study with some trial sites taking place in Europe. Um, what's the plan for getting a, a new drug or, uh, indication there? Yeah, so, uh, you know, you're right, there were nine sites in the UK, and in fact, 20% of the patients in the study came from the UK, so it was a very substantial uh, collaboration with those sites. Uh, the US is a priority for us, but obviously the EU is as important, given we have patients coming from there as well. So I would say that these are the two geographies we are most interested in, but obviously uh, we would like this drug to be available to all patients everywhere, uh, as and when we can. Uh, in regards to availability, we mentioned you don't have to be obese to take this drug. We did hear that uh, you're recommending patients are in phase three. When this actually becomes available for prescription, what indicators might be necessary in order to get that prescription from your medical professional? <laughs> so in general, the way this works is that your phase three population, uh, it really informs on who should be prescribed the drug. So the phase three trial as written talks about moderate to severe hyperphagia and various other characteristics like you know, genetically confirmed PWS, not, no significant other illnesses, et cetera. So generally a label is written in that way. So we, we haven't written nutritional phase three per se in the study. So I would imagine that assuming that a, a patient meets the criteria of having PWS, not having other major problems, and has significant enough hyperphagia in the opinion of the investigator or, or the physician, uh, that, that would meet the criteria for prescription. So um, how to phrase, it, you wouldn't see on the label. So th there's indication that you can prescribe for. Prada really is an indication, but hyperphagia phase three, is that a indication or is that just professional uh, opinion? So what you're talking about the label for the drug, what is it indicated for? 
Right. Um, that's something we don't know today. That's something that you determine with the FDA over the review process. So the FDA will look at our data, they will look at the inclusion criteria in the study, and they will work with us to figure out what the most appropriate way of defining the patient population is. But their motivation is the same as ours and of the community, which is we should be able to define who will benefit from this drug. And that's the patient who should get it. All right, we have a question regarding insulin. Um, I'm not an expert on insulin, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna phrase this question correctly, I'm gonna do my best. So historically, people with PWS have higher insulin levels and is, did the insulin, is, did the insulin levels remain high on this drug? I, I'm, I'm not sure, the question's about insulin in people with PWS. So, yeah. so what what data shows is actually that people with Prader Willi syndrome are um, are more insulin sensitive at baseline. But what we saw in the natural history study was that post meal, post prandially, they're they are not as insulin sensitive. They're insul well, they may be insulin sensitive, but their insulin levels rise um, pretty significantly post meal. And so the those levels went down, and the fasting levels also went down. Okay. Although we really just looked at the fasting levels in the study. Right. To clarify. <laughs> so we'll take one, maybe two more questions. Um, the, the One of the questions that just came in was about, um, this is a long acting release pill. So how do you dose for different sized individuals? So in, in this study, uh, the minimum weight was 20 kilograms and the maximum was 134. So we divided uh, the patients into different weight bands. And the reason is that we have to dose at a certain milligram per kilogram level. And the pill is available in certain strengths. So what we have identified from the earlier studies is that about 4.2 milligrams per kilogram is about where we want to be. So we, we titrate patients to that dose or as close as possible. There's a band, uh, so some patients may get less, but there's an ability to dose patients to levels as high as 5.8 milligrams per kilogram as well. So what we expect is that when the drug is approved, as and when the drug is approved, there will be a milligram per kilogram weight-based dosing, but within certain weight bands. So there'll be extensive description in the label, which will say this is how you dose. Mm -hmm. For the people that are in the open label extension, will they be able to have access or stay on drug until the end of the FDA review? We uh, it, initially, the, the 602 study was designed as a nine month study. And uh, based on feedback from the, the physicians, the investigators in the study, we have been increasing the duration. It was initially increased to 12 months. And at this point, it's up to 36 months. So our intent is to keep providing drug as long as we can. Um, so the answer is yes. Wonderful. Are there any plans to bring this drug to Canada? As I said, I think uh, our overall intent is to bring this drug to patients everywhere. Um, we'll have to figure out how to prioritize the different geographies, but certainly that would be the intent. Great, wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out to come and talk to us again. It was really interesting to see the data and hear the results. And of course, I think we're all cheering for you all in your process of going before the FDA. Um, as Mr. Bauer you know, pointed out to all of us today, there's, there's so much that you as a community member can do to ensure that research like this keeps happening. Um, participating in a clinical trial, educating yourself on study opportunities, and of course, helping to get involved with the funding of these of this research um, is all steps that you as a community member can take. So thank you for joining us today and learning more about Solano's study of DCCR. We hope to see you at future sessions later this week and tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Bye.